Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today we're honored to speak to Dr. Safarok Chowdhury. How are you, Akhi Saf? Assalamu alaikum, Assalam. Good to see you, Habib. Likewise, likewise. Saf studied philosophy at King's College London and completed it with the accompanying Associate of King's College Award. He then traveled to Cairo studying the traditional Islamic studies curricula at Al Azhar University. He returned to the UK to complete his master's at SOAS University with distinction. Saf's most recent book is entitled Islamic Theology and the Problem of Evil, published by AUC Press, which is the first work in Islamic studies to treat the topic within the analytic theology approach. Saf is currently lead researcher on the project Beyond Foundationalism, New Horizons in Muslim Analytic Theology, which is funded under a John Templeton Foundation grant award in association with Cambridge Muslim College and Aziz Foundation. Saf runs the website islamicanalytictheology.org on the senior editorial board of the Journal of Islamic Philosophy, and his academic work can be found on his academia page. And these links will be provided in the description box below. Now, today, Saf is going to be dissecting a number of arguments people have posed to the idea of petitionary prayer or in Muslim vocabulary, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to request something from him. So what is the point of making dua to Allah to grant us things when our fate is already sealed? And why should we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for specific things when Allah already knows what is best for us? And so on. These are just a couple of the several questions that Saf will be discussing today. Saf, whenever you're ready, you may kick it off. Shukran, my brother. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. It's great to be with you. But again, great to be back on Blogging Theology. Great work you're doing with you and the team. May Allah give it, give you all tawfiq and, and really take it from strength to strength and let it be a beacon. Um... Right. So as you introduce the topic, um, I want to look at the topic of petitionary prayer. The title of the presentation is uh, Fakhruddin al-Razi on the problem of petitionary prayer. Now, let me sort of give some background on my own interest in the topic. And then hopefully I won't spend too much time on that. And then we'll launch straight into what the issue or the issues are. Now, when I was researching, um, you know, theology in general, I found that a lot of a lot of discussion is about, you know, Allah Azza wa Jal, and 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 does does Allah have knowledge of particulars? You know, does it yet, as, as we call it in philosophy, does God know particulars? Um, and that 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 was quite a heated discussion amongst theologians and philosophers or philosopher. Um, I I I. I get that discussion and, and in other places, you know, I've discussed it and, and have my research on it. And that's linked to the the attribute of divine omniscience or the attribute of ilm. But what I found was not many studies were done on, well, uh, on how prayer fits into this whole attribute of knowledge that our scholars actually addressed it. Um, and so I was looking and looking to see if there, if there was a philosophical or theological treatment of it. Other than a few sort of um, chapters here and there, you know, sort of indirectly addressing the, the theme, I never really saw a philosophical analysis of the topic. And when I found out that Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, um, the student of Al-Ghazali, um, when he wrote on it, I thought, wow, this this is interesting. And, and, and he actually, I didn't know this, he actually addressed it quite extensively in his commentary. And I'll be talking about that in just a moment. Um, so what I hope to do today is bring to light some of the discussions um, that Imam al-Razi brings to this topic, um, how he addresses the objections raised, um, as you highlighted, as you sort of outlined at the beginning. Um, how does he address them? And in the presentation today, I want to try and simplify that discussion and, and, and bring it to the fore. And hopefully we can, you know, we can benefit from it and get some discussion going. Now, I must say, what I will be sketching out today 
uh, can be found in, in, in a lot of detail in my article that was published um, 2002, just um, in December 2002, by the Journal of Islamic Philosophy um, called in, Invoking Your Lord with Humility and in Secret, Fakhruddin Arazi on the problem of petitionary prayer. So if folks want to get more detailed analysis, information, references, uh, sources, they can consult that article um, in the journal. It's published as uh, volume 13. Um, and, um, you know, the links can be provided in inshallah. inshallah. Inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll link to the article. And I just want to say to, the, to our listeners that, you know, I read the article um and it's actually you know quite fascinating and it's well re well articulated and well structured so definitely check it out yeah. after you listen to this if if it's if academic articles it aren't someone's appetite not everyone reads academic articles i will make available a uh, sort of uh, an outline of the issue of petitionary prayer within philosophical theology and that outlines in a more simple way what the core issues are, in broad strokes, what the core issues are and what some of the responses are as well, the philosophical responses that you'd find. So if you were to pick up a book on this topic, um, hopefully, and, and you read that book, the arguments you'll find, I have summarised that in a handout. So if anyone feels that they want to consult that, that could be available from my academia page. Right, so all of that out of the way, um, let's get into the topic itself. That's just the, the screen there that, that you can see, the slide there just gives you the abstract of the article and then the sort of contents page of the journal. Um, okay, now, many people know that a dua, and by the way, let me just get some terminology out of the way in case it does, does seem quite confusing. When I use the word prayer in this presentation, mm. I mean dua. Mm -hmm. So prayer, supplication, um, petition, requesting, um, imploring, beseeching. If I use these kind of words, and the word that I'll be using the most is prayer, I don't mean uh, salah, salah which, we, mm. yeah, which we usually use. And sorry about that if it, if it is quite confusing, but it's just I use the word prayer to bring it in line with the philosophical literature. Mm, so yeah. salah, if I mention salah, I'll mention the Arabic. But when I use the word prayer, I mean a dua, mm, mm. the Arabic word a dua. So in I, I mean, every, there are books written on the importance of dua, and and, and many people would know. Uh, Sheikh Yasir Al Qadi's book on Dua, the weapon, uh, the weapon of the believer. If people aren't aware of that book, they should get it. It's an excellent summary of um, the topic of Dua. Like it covers what are the different types of Dua, the benefits of Dua, what are the conditions of Dua, the etiquette, all these things it goes through. And there is a little section actually on this topic. But the solution that the, the Sheikh puts forward, Sheikh Yasir, what he puts forward, isn't actually, interesting enough, the solution that Imam al-Razi entertains. So um, uh, if need be, I can mention that later, but I'll go through the answers that, or the responses that Imam al-Razi mentions. So dua is very, very important in Islam. We know that Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said, dua huwa li'ibadah. You know, dua is the essence of worship itself. Um, and so at the center of Islam is dua. That is one of the defining acts, asking Allah, um, imploring Allah, beseeching, asking Allah for, for forgiveness. And there are lots of types of dua our ulama have categorized by surveying the Quran and surveying the hadith. But the dua that we're particularly interested in is what's known as dua or su'al, asking, praying to Allah in terms of requesting some specific thing. So asking Allah for something in particular. That is the dua that we're going to be looking at. And that is what I'll be referring to as petitionary prayer. Because mm. what, what a Razi does, he, he tackles the problem of prayer in general. But in my article, I, I 
I, I take the problem of prayer in general, but then I focus on petitionary prayer asking because most of our prayers are requesting Allah for something, whether that's good health, forgiveness, um, you know, a, a better outcome, a better situation, improving our condition. So we're always requesting Allah for something. So petitionary prayer um, becomes a large part of our prayer is taken up with um, petitioning Allah Azza wa Jal for certain things. So I'm not my, my intention isn't to cover the fadail, the virtues, the shara'il, the conditions of prayer. I just want to launch straight into what the crux of the issue is. Now, the crux of the issue arises not just because of abstract philosophical reflection. The prop the the the, the mas'ala, the issue or the question, the qadiyya arises because of certain hadiths. And they are that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, mentioned that dua can repel the qadr. It can even change it, change predestination. You know, some people say, so So if, if praying to Allah can change one's destiny, that raises straight away some interesting questions. Does that mean now destiny? Or even Allah's um, decrees, like his decisions and his knowledge of things from before things were created, are these changeable? Does that mean dua has an efficacy, a ta'thir? This is what Imam al-Razi was particularly interested in. Is there an efficacy to, 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 to praying to Allah? So does that mean prayer is difference-making? Mm. Is it does it make a difference? Hmm. Is is does does dua become a factor that Allah considers when He providentially plans human destinies and, and entire human history? I, is it something that Allah um puts consideration in? And these are sort of these are now you can see how they become philosophical issues hmm. because they tie into the divine knowledge, they tie into you know, well. Where does that leave human free will? Where does that leave? So these questions about uh, um, human actions, um, divine the, the knowledge the now of human actions yeah. on Allah. Yeah, yeah, they start. They they now start to intersect. Mm. So, so inevitably, is um, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that even if um, even if there was no philosophical impetus like just purely from a philosophical perspective to tackle the issue of petitioning and prayer, these ahadith would have provoked some thinking um, naturally on the issue. And they did amongst the ulama. Mm. So that's hopefully um, the kind of sort of setup um, of, of dua and, and, and how it raises these sort of intellectual questions. Uh, all right. So, let me now, I know you did this at the beginning, I know you mentioned the, the way the problem is framed. Let me frame it in a bit more formal terms. Don't worry, don't worry about the symbols on, on the left of the presentation. Don't worry about that. Um, focus on just the premises. The argument, one formulation can go something like this. If, um, and this is the kind of formulation that uh, Imam al-Razi sort of deals with anyway. So it's relevant to our, our presentation today. Right, so if Allah knows everything, um, then, you know, he already knows what we're going to ask him. Mm. He knows what we're going to ask him. And if he's all-powerful, he can do anything, Jalla wa'ala, then he already knows, he has the power to fulfill all of our needs. And if he's um, the most merciful, gracious, the most kind, um, the most loving, the most caring, he would want to fulfill our needs and, and, and what we want before we even ask it anyway. Mm. So given Allah's maximum knowledge, his power, and his desire to want the best for his uh, ibad, his servants, before they even ask him, 
if these are the case, then what's the point then in making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal? That's, that's the setup. What's the point of petitioning Allah if he already knows what we want? He knows how to fulfill it. He's going to give it anyway, even if we weren't going to pray for that thing. If it was a good and he wants our best interest and, 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 and he wants our uh, well-being, then he was going to give it anyway. So then why are we praying to him then? That's the sort of framework. Um mm. And then on the left, that's just a, a sort of symbolic representation of the argument. Now, that's the problem set up. And that is the problem, really, that Imam al-Razi sort of tackles head on. Now, where does he tackle it? In two works, in two works. One of them is his philosophical work. And I mean, it's philosophical proper. I mean, it is, you know, really dense and that's known as Al-Matalib Al-Aliyah Min Ilm Al-Ilahiyat This is his book, The Lofty Sort of Objectives or Aspirations In, you know, the Science of Metaphysics Or Divinity or however, however we want to translate it Science of Theology um, That's a very, you know, very, very heavy philosophical work Anyone who is a, who studies philosophy And I mean mainly sort of philosophy in the analytic tradition, which is what most, most philosophy departments, that's the approach they have. Mm. You're going to love something like Al-Matalib Al-Aliya. I mean, this is straight out of, you know, proper sort of methodological sort of uh, thinking. Um, so he addresses it in one section, one chapter, um, and I outline this more within the article. Um mm. I believe the, well, Matalib, the Matalib is one of his last works, right? Yeah, it is, actually. And from, from the chronology of his works, Imam al-Razi, um, and the, the work itself is very interesting. Can't go into it now. Some of the article points out um, some aspects about the methodology and, and its importance. A PhD has been done on it, and other works have been done surveying the importance of it in post-classical Islamic intellectual thought. So after the so after the twelfth and thirteenth century, basically, um, so that's that's he addresses that, but he addresses it in a in a in a sort of philosophical way. There's no ayat of the Quran, mm. there's no ahadith that that he just addresses it from an intellectual. He he looks at the objections and then he addresses it intellectually, but in the mafatih, what I found was, and this is my other source, you'd see. If you look, uh, the, if you can see on the slide, there's the cover um, picture of the Tafsir Fakhruddin al Razi, known as the Mafatih al Ghayb, the um, Keys to the Unseen, which is his sort of encyclopedic Tafsir of the Quran. One of my favorites, by the way. I mm -hmm. think Razi's Tafsir, I think it's superb. Um, and there are there are chapters of there are aspects of the Mafatih that I'm finishing off publishing, one on his 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 uh, doctrine of al-Qadha wal qadr and a philosophical analysis of it, and some other topics in the Mafatih. I think it's a wonderful tafsir. And what's if interesting... I'm, if I'm, I'm ever researching about an ayah, uh, Razi's uh, tafsir is a mandatory uh, go-to, absolutely. I love it. I mean, you know, it's uh, only a tafsir, only Imam al Razi will be thinking about the masail, the issues in the way that he does mm. and brings it into the Quran. Mm. Mm. Okay, so it's not for everyone, I know. But what I found what's interesting in the, in the tafsir, he takes the exact same ar arguments that are in the matalib, whichever way you want to look at, whichever way around, but mm. the same arguments that are in the matalib al aliya, he addresses them in the tafsir. But now he brings sort of more um, scriptural responses. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. And so um, uh, that that's interesting. So he's in one work, he's addressing it philosophically. Mm. In another work, he's addressing it exegetically. Mm, mm, mm. And so what I try and do in the article is that um, I, I try and in my response, put a mixture of both. Yeah. Um, and then you, anyone who reads the article, hopefully find that the more details there. So those are my two sources, um, his philosophical work and his um, uh, exegetical work. 
if the philosophical work is not anyone's cup of tea, the the tafsir will be more than sufficient. It will be yeah. more than more than sufficient. So those then are, are, are our sources. Now, in the in the article, I do go over twelve objections, mm. but if we group them together, I think we can get six main the objection the objections can be grouped into six main categories. Mm. And I've named them as follows. Um, and then I'll go through the what the objection is, and then Imam Fakhruddin al Razi's response. So the first the first one is known as the impassibility problem. Now, this is just another way of saying that if if um Allah is not su- subject to change, mm. if Allah is immutable, his knowledge doesn't increase or decrease, um He's not subject to sort of what they call temporal changes. Mm. However, if he isn't in one state, then he acquires another state or something like that. Um, if Allah is unchanging, and then how can how can we change Allah by praying? If we make dua to Allah, how can we change an absolute perfect being who's unchangeable? What effect is du'a going to have on an unchangeable being? That's the general sort of um, sort of uh, a summary of the problem. And I'll, I'll go through them again. I'll just summarize them each now. Then there's the problem of omniscience. I think most of most readers will probably, and viewers will probably know what the problem of omniscience is in general. This is that if, if um, Allah already knows what we're going to do, then what's the point of us praying um because one he's what he already knows what we're going to do so in what sense are we free to make the dua and how are we going to how are we going to cause any change in allah's knowledge anyway so if allah knows we're going to pray what's the point of us praying because we're going to do what he knows anyway so that brings the problem of foreknowledge into here we can only do what Allah is going to know. So in what way are we freely praying anyway? It looks like it's pointless because we're just we're compelled to do what Allah already knows from eternity. So not only is there no efficacy to the prayer, there's, we haven't even prayed freely. So that's the second problem. Now, the third problem says the problem of omnibenevolence. Again, I, I touched on that in the formulation. If Allah is has has um jeweled or generosity the most maximal generosity he's always going to do what is best for his servants before they ask for it if allah was going to grant what is good for the servant before the servant prays then what has my prayer added to that it looks like prayer is superfluous looks like dua uh, added nothing substantive it's just an empty action then What's the point of me praying if Allah was already going to give it to me anyway? Because that's what he would want to do, right? The assumption is he'd want to do that anyway. So that's the problem of omnibenevolence. Then there's a the problem of decree, the qada of Allah. And that links to the omniscience problem. How do we change? How can dua, a finite temporal act, change the qada of Allah, Allah's decree min al azal from eternity. So Allah's decrees, His decisions, His knowledge of all things, His desire that things be a certain way. How can a temporal thing, something done in time, space and time, change something that's already been decided from eternity? This is known as the, the divine decree problem. Am I going to give that the, the dua that much power? That's what the objector raises. Mm. Then there is these two interesting objections to dua. This is where it gets a bit scriptural. One objection is what I've labelled as a problem of bad comportment or sort of adab. The objector says making dua is actually bad manners. How is it bad? Well, you're, you're... you're commanding someone who's your superior 
to do something for you. Do this for me. Can you do that for me? So in the Arabic language, when we make dua, we use this the sirat al-amr, right? We use the imperative form. Mm. But the imperative form, the objection goes, must come from high to low, from someone who's in, superior to someone inferior. A command cannot come from properly, mm. from an inferior to a superior. Mm. So the subordinate, insubordinate um, symmetry or asymmetry. So the objection goes, make, making dua is bad comportment. Mm. So requesting Allah, Allah give me this, Allah give me that, Allah grant me this, Allah grant me that. Mm. This is bad etiquette. Mm. So therefore prayers, not only is prayer not efficacious, but it's also bad, you know, bad manners. What, would, it, would it be fair to say that for this specific objection, that it's uh, obje not objecting to the core or the substance of dua, but to the most common forms of articulation of the dua yes so the yes. most so but obviously it's still relevant to us yeah it brings that, the objection yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. because some people want to he says some people want to problematize dua in general praying to allah in general with yeah. these kind of objections the yeah. others are quite philosophical right you know they mm -hmm. but th this is not really philosophical per se mm -hmm. um but so arazi is trying to bring rahimahullah he's trying to bring objections sort of from all angles he's trying to bring them together and then he wants to address them all um mm. together from all its facets uh so bad the problem of bad comportment is sort of adab. um and then the other one that's interesting is the problem of spiritual impediment again like i said i'll go through each each in a bit detail the problem of spiritual impediment says dua is actually quite a selfish act mm. The objection goes, you're praying to Allah because, you know, some because there's some, some kind of aggrandizement involved or some kind of um, you're seeking, you're reveling in the act itself rather than the object of your act. Mm -hmm. Allah Azza wa Jal. Rather, you are reveling in the act and trying to 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 sort of aggrandize yourself, mm -hmm. self-aggrandizement. Mm -hmm. But that's not a spiritually good thing. That is not good for the nafs. Mm. So ra rather, the objection goes, it looks like prayer becomes an impediment, a manic, to getting sort of lofty, um, sort of religious or conscientious religious, um, a religious conscientiousness. It becomes mm. a barrier um, to sort of spiritual growth. So these are the kind of six um, sort of, main problems that we can group the problems of, of, of petitionary prayer or prayer in general. Now, let's then go into some of the, the replies. We would go into each of the six objections and then look at some of the replies that Imam al-Razi sort of gives. <clears throat> Again, as I, as I mentioned, the details of these and the sort of the philosophical analysis can be gained from the article, the journal article. Okay, so the impassibility problem. Now, with these replies, um, Imam al-Razi, we see some of the objections he gives quite a lot of space to. Other times, he just sort of thinks, I'm going to give a one-line response and moves on. Mm. So it's interesting what kind of arguments he thinks are worth his time or um that he thinks is 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 sort of sub an objection that's substantive maybe one way to know whether he thinks an objection is substantive is the length of response he gives to it that's one way maybe of ascertaining it's not a very scientific way but we can gauge imam razi sort of how he's looking at certain objections and where he thinks some objections are stronger than others. But one thing he does do, which is interesting, and, and authors have pointed this out, and there seems to be a very particular thing about Imam al Razi, is that when he lays out objections, he is detailed when he lays out the objections. But when he gives his replies, Rahimahullah, sometimes his replies are just quite, some people might say they're very superficial. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and and he, you know, he doesn't delve into the answers. His his answers aren't as detailed as the objections. Yeah. So this but, is something. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, so it's not, one theory I have, personal theory, yeah. um, is that you know, I, I think first of all, Imam Al Razi probably did not foresee um, uh, how accessible his commentary will become to yeah. you know the Muslim Ummah. Right, and uh, sometimes you could see that maybe he's per perhaps challenging himself at times. You know, detailing out these these objections, and if he feels that okay, look, no, this is something that I myself am yet to answer. know the answer to. So yeah, yeah, yeah. let me give this some thought and let me write it down before I possibly forget the answer. Absolutely. While while he may lay down another objection because he wants to be comprehensive, but. For him, it's a it's a cakewalk. He already has the answer in his head. He probably th thinks to himself, "You know what? Me and my fellow peers who are going to be reading my commentary. I mean, your average Khalid is not going to be reading my commentary, right? So uh, I don't have to worry about him. My fellow peers and I, we could. This is a cakewalk for us. So yeah. let's, let's give a two liner and let's move on. Yeah, you know, I mean." Who knows how he's thinking, right? Uh, but but I think you're right, though, because and that's what we do, right? That's what any academic I, does. Sometimes you address yeah. the point. <laughs> yeah. You address the point in detail, and some some on some questions, other questions, you say, "Yeah, well, here's something to consider. I'll come back to it." And yeah. we have to remember: so often people think a tafsir is written in a linear way, like mm. they, in one go they just sat down and wrote it mm. from back to front. Mm. Sometimes you know, the ulama came back, and the editing wasn't. You know, we don't have the ease of editing that we do now. You know, so. Um, but one thing we can say is any 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 masala or qadiyya that Imam Al Razi does raise, he does address it in other works. He doesn't just just you know these come up in other works and then he addresses it there. Sometimes he doesn't, and it's natural to not answer many leave questions unanswered. Um, so I, I think it shouldn't surprise. It's a human. This is a human product, a tafsir. It's not. Um, it's it's a scholar who's one of the most, you know one of the highest intellectuals, you know, in, 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 in medieval history, for sure, you know, grappling with these issues. And like you said, sometimes he'll have an answer that he knows a question to straight away. Other times you jot something down, maybe come back to it later. Maybe he just, because, you he know, just right now, uh, tafasir are, are accessible via the, the click yes, of a mouse. Us, so, you, yeah. so you may have an, a layman who can read Arabic, probably checking out one of his, one of Imam Razi's commentaries. He see Imam Razi teasing out this these arguments uh but probably did not respond to them at that at that point sufficient point, yeah and the layman gets confused but you know imam al-razi doesn't have that layman in mind coming in access to the commentary yeah. without you know the, uh, you know uh, having uh, a mentor nearby that he can consult or reading the rest of his works so you know it's not a jala i yeah. mean we know that clearly you know this is uh, uh anyone who picks up uh, al Ghay will know straight away. No, this is not a portable tafsir. This is uh, it's gonna we're gonna you know this, this is really you know very rarefied you know masail in there, and it's wonderful discussions that are in there. Okay, so excellent point there actually that, that you know this is this is the methodology of tafsir, and 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 so this is not a a, a deficiency on on the part of the author, right? So, oh, so this objection then if, you know about Allah being impassable. God being impassable, unchanging in, in his planning, his decisions, you know, everything that he's done, there can't be any change. Then how can prayer affect that change in essentially an unchangeable, perfect creator? Um, that must mean prayer has no power. It has no tethid here. So Imam Razi, one, one of the replies that I construct in the article is that if if Allah is beyond time, so the doctrine of eternalism, um, that Allah is not subject to space and time. Um, so that's, if that is the case, um, then what and what an eternal creator can do is because they're outside of time. They can factor in when they were planning human destiny and creaturely history, they can factor in which temporal prayers would have been made at what time and where and factor that in the, the, the whole providential plan. So there's no change necessarily on, on the creator's part. Um, the creator remains unchanging. It's just 
the prayer that was factored in would, would have been made at the time that it's made. And then if that prayer was answered, the answer would have already been factored in from eternity. Yeah. So Allah SWT would say, uh, I know Khalid is going to make dua yes. requesting XYZ on May 20th, 2023. And in response, I will actualize his request 10 days later at this time on this yeah. date. And that was yeah. my decree or Allah's decree and decision that it actualized 10 days later when that temporal act of dua was made. But it was done not at the time itself um, in a de novo way, in a new way, but it was done, it was decreed for pre-eternity in Allah's knowledge and his power had enabled that decree to be actualized. Mm. Um, so a timeless, eternal sort of creator can do that because they're outside of time. So that was one, one response um, you can have to the challenge and that goes some way to assuaging the objection. Again, I must say though, Imam Fakhruddin al Razi doesn't in any way that I remember anyway, um, he doesn't say that the res these responses are the only ones. He, you know, he gives a reply and, you know, he felt these were sufficient to deal with the issue. And where it was, the, the argument wasn't clear, I constructed it from um, Imam al Razi's sort of our ideas and beliefs from elsewhere of, mm. in his works, yeah. Okay, so that's the impassibility problem. Uh, and again, you know, you can find the philosophical uh, sort of arguments for these in the contemporary literature and the handout that I mentioned at the beginning. It's the same argument. How does something temporal affect something atemporal? That's essentially the mas'ala. How does something here in the world affect something up in heaven here on earth how does it affect something up in heaven okay so the omniscience problem now this was a problem as we mentioned briefly that if Allah is omniscient knows everything and what he knows will inevitably come to pass then irrespective of what anyone does whether it is dua or anything hmm. it's not going to make a change to Allah's knowledge so that must mean our acts in general, and more specifically, our acts of making dua, what's the point? If Allah already knows I'm going to pray for, let's say, Khalid to become better. Um, but what's what's the point of me praying then? If Allah already knows what I'm going to do, then what's the power of my prayer got to do with anything? If I'm already going to do what Allah knows that I'm going to do. One, am I, I'm not free to, to actually do it because Allah, Allah's knowledge according to this objection, precludes my, 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 my choice to do otherwise. And two, if it precludes my choice to do otherwise, then I might as well not do anything. What's the point? I might as well sit there idly and not do anything. This is why uh, th this sort of carries a kind of fatalistic element. Mm -hmm. There's a fatalistic element here. So what, what, is it, what can Imam al-Razi attack here in this foreknowledge argument? So his reply is, okay, Look, how can you jump from d divine foreknowledge to this idea of, you know, shrugging your shoulders and resigning and say, you know, we're fated. What's the point of praying? Prayer is pointless because we're fated to do what Allah Azza wa Jal knows anyway. Um, be uh, because the fatalist, the fatalist says, whatever you choose to do or not to do, whether you want to do it or not, you're going to do whatever it is that you're fated to do. And in this case, what you're fated to do is what Allah knows. So you don't have the ability to act otherwise. Um, so Arazi said this fatalism doctrine is, is silly because we don't, um, when we're hungry, we don't say to alleviate my hunger, irrespective of whether I eat or don't eat, it's not going to make a difference. Actually, no, it will. Your eating will make a difference to your hunger. So he says, look, this is, this is no one, no one um, practically believes this or acts in this way. Yeah. You know, this kind of uh, a, a fatal, in this kind of fatalistic way. And that's one of his responses. His other response is just to say, look, this mas'ala of foreknowledge is a complex mas'ala anyway. 
And ultimately, we, we just have to appeal to our creaturely finitude. We just don't know how Allah knows everything beforehand and yet how we can act in a meaningful way. We just don't know how the two in any meaningful way or any comprehensive way can be reconciled, if indeed they ought to be reconciled. So on one hand, Ar-Razi says, fatalism cannot be an option because we can make an intervention. We don't just sit there idly and say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm in a burning house. Either it's going to burn me to the ground or it's not going to burn me to the ground. Either way, I, I can't, my actions aren't going to make a difference either way. Well, it can, you can run out of the house. Um, either you, you adopt a fatalist doctrine, which is erroneous, or you just hold your hand up and say, how, how do we account for how a, a, an omniscient creator knows all things? You know, we just, we just don't know. Um, I think this comes up a lot in, you know, uh, you know, in discussions on reconciling free will with, yeah. uh, with predestination. And, and does divine foreknowledge cause us to do what we do? Yeah. Or is Allah's foreknowledge merely knowing in advance what the causes of our actions are? Right. And, you know, one philosopher gave the analogy of uh, the infallible weather forecaster. Right. So think of an infallible yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, weather forecaster. Right. He always gets the weather right, but it's not going to rain because he forecasted that it's going to rain. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the forecasting itself is not the cause of the rainfall. Um, yes. The, it, it, since he's infallible, it is going to rain. No Absolutely. doubt, but the cause of the rainfall is not the act is not the forecasting itself. And similarly, when we're thinking of you know divine foreknowledge, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knowing everything in advance, that that mere knowledge itself need not be the you know the causal determinant for our actions. So yes, it is very well the case that whatever I do, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows it, and it's impossible that I will do something. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala did not already foreknow, but it is not the foreknowledge itself that it is that is the cause. There could be another cause, yeah, it, but yeah. Allah foreknew that cause of my actions. So you know, there's a big leap here being made to attributing the cause to the foreknowledge itself, right? And and, and as you said, th this right, argument right. could extend to everything. It's not just du'a. You know, yes, this, yes. You know, why create yes. us? Why did Allah create us when He already knows the end result? This, Put us in hell right away, right? It's very similar yeah. to this kind of argument, right? Absolutely. I think you, you've, you've given a brilliant solution there. And this is what you'll find in the theological literature, that knowledge knowledge is factive. So there is an object of your knowledge. That's true. So Allah Azza wa knows. It's not that nothing, you know, he knows what everyone is going to do. So, so, so there is that element there. But it's descriptive, it's wasfi, as you mentioned, but it's not mm. causative. That's the, that's the response. Mm. It doesn't make you do it. Mm. And, the, and, and the other thing is that and this is a good lesson for those who are doing um, studying logic. So if you study modal logic, mm. you look at it, it's, this is a, there's a modal fallacy here. Now, it might be leave it for some homework if uh, the, the viewers are interested in where the modal fallacy lies, i.e., um, if it's what necessarily... It's necessarily the case that Allah Azza wa Jal knows what everyone's going to do. Yeah, it's, it's necessarily the case. But does it follow from that that you must do the action that you do? It is necessary that you do the act you do. Now, can you make that modal shift? Logicians say you can't. That's the modal fallacy. Because to, to, you know you can't say Allah must know what I do. Therefore, I must do what he knows. The exactly. must here needs to be differentiated, disambiguated. Mm -hmm. And this is a good lesson. This is a textbook fallacy in modal logic that, you know, the, known as the modal fallacy. You can't go from, if it's necessary that God knows what I do, which is true, he, I will do what he knows. But can I infer from that? Therefore, I cannot do otherwise. And this was a solution given by Al-Farabi, actually. Mm -hmm. Um which is, you know, is one of my favorite responses because it really gets to the logic of the issue. Um, so that modal, uh, that's a modal fallacy. Um, okay, so that's the problem of omniscience. Mm. 
The divine decree problem, again, is very similar to the immutability problem. If Allah uh, is, qadha is, is, is um, fixed, his decree has been fixed from, or, you know, his decree has come, to, will come to pass, but it's been f- decided from eternity. It can't be changed. Then how can me making a dua make Allah change what is already immutable? So it's similar to the impassibility. Uh, it's just like a subspecies of the impassibility problem. How can I do something now that's going to change something that's fixed in eternity? Again, Imam al-Razi says that, first of all, prayer is not pointless, and he's, he's careful to point that out because there are huge benefits in praying. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, both, as mentioned in the hadith, the numerous benefits, and, of course, um, benefits for the person praying and the fact that it, it does have, have effect in the world. So he goes, prayers aren't pointless, Um but again, he attacks the fatalistic stance towards the matters of divine decree. We can't just, it's nonsensical to say um, that my prayer, um, I can't make any change to the divine decree, so I'll just resign in the face of the divine decree and not do anything. The other argument, of course, he does give is that um, Allah tells us to make dua and and. On the basis of that du'a, Allah will make an intervention. I.e. the concern that Allah has is made purely because of that du'a. So Allah is concerned about the du'a being made. That's important. So even if we can't reconcile how it is from eternity, Allah has, his decree will come to pass and how everything fits in his decree. Um, we are We are told to pray to Allah. Uh, and that prayer will affect a, a change. That intervention of praying will affect a change. What we cannot do is be idle. Uh, I think in the beginning, uh, you you alluded to uh, the fact that there are hadith um, related to this point, that dua can change, um, you know, uh, uh, Allah's decree. And from what I recall, I mean, it's been a few years, but uh, from what I recall, uh, and I don't know if it's a consensus, but uh, yes. many scholars have interpreted that as not referring to what is written in the preserved tablet, in the and Mahfuz, but referring to the books that the angels on our shoulders are, are writing. Um, I'm not sure if you've come across any other interpretations um, for that hadith. Yeah, so this is the Mubram, Ghair Mubram sort of idea. So decree that is changeable and then the decree that is immutable. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. That is that definitely that's that's one of the standard responses we will find. I'm not sure actually, if it's the consensus on I'm not sure. I don't want to. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. On, on, yeah, 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 I, yeah, I just know it's a scholarly. Right. Opi- I know it's a scholarly. It opinion, is. It is. It is. This is. I don't know if there are other opinions. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The other interpretation is that this. The hadith is interpreted to be not in a literal sense, mm. but in a in a non-literal sense now. It's not that the qada itself mm. can be changed, but what did what does that stand for? You know, what how do we now non-literally interpret it? And so ulama gives some kind of glosses as to what that could mean. So there is that interpretation as well. Um what was the other interpretation? I'm just trying to think of off the top of my head. You, you um uh, there is a one that's a non-figurative interpretation. If when it comes to me, I'll mention it. I'll, I'll mention it. Um, uh, I, it's, it's, you know, I, I guess you know another way uh, that perhaps we might uh, understand it, and I'm, and I'm just being hesitant because uh, I don't like giving opinions for myself. Uh, but if we understand divine decree as Allah foreknowing what we were going to do in addition to writing down, uh, not literally, of course, of what we're going to do in the preserved tablet, and then yeah. willing, willing what we're going to do. Um, it could be the case, and that is what divine decree is, knowing and documenting in the preserved tablet and willing what everything that's going to happen. If, and as we just said, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, a few minutes ago, that Allah... Allah's foreknowledge is not causative, but descriptive. 
um, your, ulti- your decision as to whether you're going to be making dua or not would have already influenced what would have been foreknown and, uh, and, and documented in the preserved tablet because that was under, you have the free will and, uh, and that was under your control, whether, whether you want to make dua or not, right? And so uh, you, you could think about it in a way that, look, you are kind of responsible for what has already been foreknown and for what has already been documented in the preserved tablet because you have the free will to do what it is you're going to be doing. So I guess there's that that could be another way of um, maybe understanding how we influence uh, our own uh, fate uh, in a way, given that there is free will and we're we're, we're not hard determinists, we're not jabariya uh, in that sense, possibly. But uh, you know, uh, I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a definitely a huge a huge discussion that that, and this is why petitionary prayer becomes. It intersects with so many of these issues mm. um, that are discussed separately anyway. But this is why I said at the beginning, I found it quite remarkable then, despite, you know, discussions about, you know, what we've just been talking about now, and then al-qadha wal qadar and then al-ikhtiyar wal-jabar, all these kind of ideas, you know, free choice and, you know, determinism and, and, and uh, uh, libertarianism, all these kind of ideas. No one sort of, you know, the, the radar sort of been off or the, the, the focus hasn't been on this particular matter. Um, so, yeah, so you're right. And the, these solutions uh, uh, we'll find in the Hadith literature. And then there's the, the other one, of course, that Razi doesn't entertain, which I'm not going to talk about now. And this is the, the, the notion of asbab or causes. And, 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 and it's understandable why he wouldn't go for the causal discussion, because being broadly an Ash'ari him, himself, you know, occasionalism is the is the doctrine mm. that you know he he subscribes to, and so there isn't uh, creation doesn't cause and effect isn't a system put in place that Allah you know in His wisdom and 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 you know power and knowledge and decree has decided to function properly. Mm. Um, Rather, everything is dependent on Allah enabling something to cause something else. So it's understandable why He wouldn't bring causality into the discussion which he doesn't mm. um though i believe that there are some assumptions about causality which you have to make for certain of his replies to be valid um so then the raises the question of whether when he was replying was he only replying from his particular theological perspective or was he offering a broad ambit of, of responses because in a paper that i'm writing i finished writing hopefully it will be in its peer review stages um, Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah's response to petitionary prayer. In that, it's all about causality. Mm-hmm. It's all about causality. And that becomes part of the way Sheikh al-Islam addresses the issue of petitionary prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so so that was that's just an interesting sort of observation on how different scholars address the issue. The thing that I wanted to mention about omniscience but I think you covered it. We can come back to it if, if we need to. Now, this omnibenevolence problem, again, going back to uh, what we mentioned earlier, uh, it, it is that if Allah will give you what is good for you, then he is going to give it to you. He shouldn't give it to you conditional on a prayer. He would, he would give it to you regardless. He'll give it to you regardless. And so... Um, What's then the point of you praying? Your prayer isn't the reason why he's giving it to you. He's giving it to you because he's the most generous, the most loving, compassionate, and so on. So one of our Razi's arguments could be, in reply to this, is look, yes, it's true. Yeah, Allah gives things before we ask for it. Um, And sometimes he may not even give things that we do ask because it's not for our good. Um, so, yes, prayer may not be a factor he considers in granting you your goods. Um, but, but we can't rule out dua a priori. We cannot rule it out a priori because there are times when Allah mentions a good will be granted conditional on you praying. So in the article, I mentioned an example of um, like the dua of the prophets. 
sometimes Allah wants to grant things through the act of his servant making the dua. It is on account of that that Allah grants the good. It did, must he do that? No, he doesn't have to. But there are times when he wants to make it conditional on the dua. If it, as one who's petitioning for us so we understand that we come to realize that maybe we're not in control um, for an act that brings us closer to Allah. Um, and for many reasons. Yeah. Um, so it could be that we shouldn't a priori rule out prayer because it could have been because of that prayer that we subsequently do that Allah grants the good based on it. So this is one of his responses that he can give. It's, the, it's on account of the dua that Allah grants the good. So long as that's even possible, so long as we can show examples from the hadith or the Quran that this is the case, then we know now from scripture that Allah fa factors dua in to, to give a good. Allah will grant a good, making it conditional on dua. You know, when, it so, comes to, when it comes to yeah. these sorts of arguments, you could see yeah. the theological presupposition, unwarranted yes, yes. theological presupposition being made regarding how, you tell, how to even understand Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's attributes, and we, and we see this with with other people, right? With, like with Christians. Oh, so if you, if your God is all loving, you know, He's a wadud, you know, uh, how how is it that He does not love some people? Or if your God is or as, as atheists will say, if your God is all good, then why does he allow evil to occur, right? And they look at these, and same thing with this argument that you're, that you're, trying, that you're addressing here. You know, if Allah is all generous and gracious, then, you know, and they look at these attributes in isolation, and they don't look at them holistically and, 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 and see how they could complement each other. Because, you know, as you just said, you know, uh, Allah SWT is also all wise. There could be a reason why he is, uh, you know, with, you know, not answering your prayer at a, you know, uh, uh, or, or not giving you something unless you pray for it, etc. Yes. So there could be uh, benefits and wisdom behind that. And so I think this is an issue with with, with these sorts of objections uh, that they're looking at, honing in on attributes and isolation of the others, and they're presupposing that okay. Uh, given this, Allah, we expect that God behaves or acts in a certain way, and, uh, and, and that's so where in the response. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In, in the in the response in the article, I, I mentioned that another, a maneuver that Arazi can make is mm. why grant the assumption mm, mm. of you know a divine, the divine welfare, the welfare you know sort of model of divine action that only. The, the Allah is only bound to do the aslah or only do something in the masalih um, or in the perceived masalih of his creatures. Again, going back to, of course, his theological um, sort of framework being broadly ash'ari in that sense that um, what he, Allah is not duty bound to do what is the optimal good. Um, so uh, so he, he, he can attack like you mentioned, the presupposition. So that I don't want to go into that because that would take us sort of further down, you know, unpacking other assumptions and, and things like that. So that is it also in the article. So I I guess the point you made is that these all these attributes, and I put this in the handout as well for those who want to read, there are assumptions about omniscience, assumptions about uh, divine goodness and fairness, mm. that again, those assumptions themselves need to be interrogated. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, so it's omnibit benevolence here. And some of it, Arazi points out in his response, is because we're talking about ultimately matters of the ghaib, like how does a prayer, how does the, how does a prayer one, how is it factored into Allah's providence? And how does he respond to prayer? We don't know. Isn't it? Ultimately, it's a matter of the ghaib. So, um, uh, so, so long as all we have to show is that are there instances where Allah factors in dua to make it conditional on granting some good? Yes. We find that in the hadith in many places. Um, you know, even with the case, you could say, for example, um, asking when Abu Huraira radiallahu an asked the messenger of Allah to pray for his mother. Um, the conversion 
that good of conversion was granted on account of Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam making the dua to Allah azza wa Um So there are many, many instances where a good is granted may, may conditional on the prayer. Now Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu could have said, said, yeah, whether you pray or not, Ya Rasulullah, Allah is going to grant it anyway, right? Because, you know, why pray at all? Praying or not praying, is it going to make a difference? Because Allah already knows if my mum's going to yeah, change my mum, my, my mother's heart. Um, so you know, let's just not do anything. But he asked the messenger of Allah to pray, and on account of that prayer, the good was granted, right? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there's many instances we can show where the good is granted in abeyance. The good is kept in abeyance until the prayer is made, and it's granted on the condition of that prayer, or on on the enact enacting that prayer. Okay. Um, the penultimate objection, the problem of bad comportment. Arazi says to this objection, which says, look, praying to Allah, constantly using the imperative is 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 bad manners, is disrespectful. Therefore, dua, we shouldn't make dua, it's disrespectful. Um, if you were in the court of a king or ruler, sultan, and you kept making demands, it might come to a point where you're probably going to be ejected out of the majlis mm. or the court for your impudence and your, 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 your disrespect. Similarly, in the court of the king of kings, surely you wouldn't keep making demands in this way. The act itself, there's something, um, uh, you know, below respect about it. Arazi says, well, hang on, that doesn't make sense. What if I beseech Allah? Yes, grammatically, all the du'as are in the imperative form. But we know that these imperative forms are, uh, 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 they one, they can carry different meanings. So when you say, so when we ask, when we are commanding Allah, what, what we're actually doing is we're beseeching him because we're in a position of inferiority. Um, but if we do it out of reverence and Acknowledging our own weakness and finitude and need and iftikhar, then then there's nothing wrong in in asking Allah for that. And in fact, this is the kind of thing that Allah loves. This is why I put it in the title of my article, imploring Allah with humility and in secret, because Allah likes us. He likes to see us pray sincerely with humility and doing it in secret not making a spectacle of it. Um, so if it's done with proper etiquette, then actually it's not something that's blameworthy and bad, bad adab or etiquette. In fact, this is superior etiquette. So asking a king, you know, in a respectful way or asking someone who's your elder in a respectful way, there's nothing blameworthy about that, requesting something for someone as long as it's done with the proper comportment. So Razi, I think, was scratching his head, thinking, "Why is this a bad argument? Why is this about you know an objection? Just turn the table, do it properly, and it'd be quite efficacious." You know, and I think uh, you know, uh, you know, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, also that, uh, that that you know, before we actually make the request, that you you praise Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala first, right? That that you're, you're actually doing dhikr, you're glorifying Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, um, and then you you make that request. I think maybe the people that kind of that would probably put forth this kind of argument are probably trying to see how we deal with each other in terms of you know custom because we always say may you please may please, you yes. kindly you know uh, I would appreciate it if you right and this is how we're accustomed to speaking to each other because if I just said you know. Um, uh, Saf, uh, give me that water. You know, yeah, obviously you're not yeah. going to like that, right? But at the same yeah. time, I'm not singing your praises and glorifying you before I made the request, yeah. right? So, so obviously, it's not a perfect um, uh, analogy. So, you know, if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, declares that uh, one can um, call out to Him in this manner, um, then who are we to say that you know um, He will be offended or not be? Offended? Right? That, yeah. that's, uh, that's certainly his prerogative. And I think this is born out of the fact about how we are accustomed to dealing with each other 
um, and neglecting to factor into consideration that Allah Taala, you know, would approve yeah, I, being spoken to in a certain way. And he, and obviously, he knows what is in our hearts, and we don't know what other what is in the hearts of other people. You know, I would accept that my father speaks to me in a certain way, uh, or uh, a good friend of mine would expect me uh, would be okay with me saying, you know, pass the water. Right, because we're really good friends, and he knows that I don't intend any disrespect by that. Um, while if I walk up to a stranger and I say the same thing, he will not appreciate that. Well, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows all hearts. He knows we're not commanding him. He knows what we're actually feeling and what we truly intend when we make dua and we we use the imperative form. So that's perfectly okay, right? And I think uh, we just have to bear in mind that he knows what we intend. And that's all that there really is to it, in a way. <laughs> and you're right. I mean, look, that's one of the etiquettes of, of du'a is to make du'a expecting a response from Allah Azza wa Jal. We know that because in Baqarah, in fact, this is the ayah that Razi interprets at quite length. And I do mention a bit of it in my article. إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي إِنَا إِنِّي قَلِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَ تَدَعِي إِذَا دَعَانِ Tell my... my, my 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 servant that you know i if if they you know pray to me or implore me i am near and i and i will respond to the one who calls out to me and then you know zakaria alayhi salam i can't remember which uh surah it's in innaka samiu dua allah you hear verily you hear you listen to the to the prayers to the supplications, you know, you 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 hear it, um, and so the, the the expectation, the etiquette is to pray, expecting a response from Allah, but obviously not an immediate response. There's no, the, 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 there's nothing, and that's a whole other discussion that Allah must respond straight away, but it must be prayed. The etiquette is to pray earnestly with humility, uh, 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 but expecting that Allah Azza wa Jal will um, re will reply to that dua. Brilliant. All right. So, the, so the last one, the spiritual impediment one. So, the objection uh, to reiterate it is, when people pray, the objection goes, what they're looking for is self satisfaction. They want to. They want certain psychologically satisfying states, um, and so. Really, the focus becomes themselves and not Allah Azza wa Jal, who is the one to whom we are praying. Um, and if that's the case, then dua becomes a prevention rather than, it becomes a hindrance rather than a power of development and transformation. But Arazi counters by arguing that look, if dua is performed again properly, um, and I mentioned some of the etiquettes of du'a that he mentions in the tafsir, in, in the article. Um, but if one makes du'a again properly, focusing only on Allah Azza wa Jal, being, being diligent in one's du'a, doing it out of, you know, earnestness and, 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 and love of Allah and, and, and out of that desire, um, actually it becomes, he says, Imam Razi says, one of the closest ways to get to Allah Azza wa Jal, and one of the strongest bridges to build between a, 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 a devotee and, and his creator. And then he goes on to give an interpretation of the ayah, when my servant calls out to me, I'm telling him I am near. Um, I am near. I respond to the one who calls out to me. So he gives a very, you know, he says this is one of the most... Um, powerful verses of the Quran where ultimately he think about the creator of the universe zooming in on you zooming in on you specifically saying I will be I will draw near to you if you call out to me um, and I'm ready to open that door should you seek it my door is open. Are you ready to come in? So Imam al said, this is one of the most beautiful ways to build that relationship with one's creator. So it's not that this is an impediment. This actually becomes the great, one of the most powerful ways to get closer to Allah Azza wa Jal.
So, so in that way, he kind of responds to the objection. And this is not the philosophical one, as you mentioned earlier, that the last two, four, uh, five, and six, are not really philosophical objections. They're objections made, um, you know, that's related to to sort of acts and one's own states. Uh, so those are the kind of six broad objections and replies that Imam Ar-Razi gives. Mm. And some concluding points is, you know, just from the presentation is that, you know, this 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 notion of dua al su'al, asking Allah Azza wa Jalla, petitioning Allah, has some interesting philosophical and theological questions. And we've teased out some of this today, albeit in broad strokes. There are responses to them. Again, these responses, the assumption is these responses have to be watertight, philosophical. Not really. The responses just have to show that, you know, it can weaken or diffuse or disarm some, you know, uh, the, the force um, of or redirect some of the force of the objections. Um, because the, the objections themselves rest on certain assumptions that they, they themselves are objectionable. Um the there is a ta'thir of dua, there is an efficacy to the dua because it's a way praying brings one closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, for example. What greater um power can something have than drawing the creator to oneself? Um there are a lot of benefits to dua. Uh, again, Ar Razi mentions those, although we didn't give a, a, a list of these today. Um Prayers have an amount, enormous amount of significance, significant effects on the one praying, um, whether that's their own psychological states, feeling calm, you know, being uh, assured that Allah Azza wa Jal has listened to their prayer and, and forgiven them and, and, and granted them uh, what they've requested, and their akhirah welfare, um, their afterlife welfare. Um Again, that's a matter of the ghayb, so that's not something we can judge now. But because we believe in Allah and and and, and the person petitioning Allah has confidence in whatever, whatever Allah says, has full conviction that it will be granted as part of the afterlife welfare. And ultimately, how prayers are factored into our acts or how our acts are factored into the divine providence, this is really beyond human knowledge. Um but we're told that Allah has given it consideration. Mm. Has given it consideration. Um, so I think in a, in a in a sort of broad sort of broad brush way, we've gone through the problem of of what's known as a problem of petitionary prayer. How in our tradition, ulama have dealt with it. It's not an issue that's gone unnoticed. Mm. Mm. Um. Imam al-Razi, to my knowledge, is probably the one who's addressed it in the most extensive way in his tafsir and his philosophical works. If there are others that have addressed it in, in equally sort of detailed, substantive term, please let me know. Um, I would love to, to discuss that. And there are some responses given. And, you know, this is an interesting area that in intersects with other areas um, of, 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 of theology. So I hope you know that was sort of sort of broadly beneficial um and again though we didn't go into the weeds and the kind of my intention was not to mm. um i wanted to just get the sort of framework um out there and then the article and the handout that i mentioned at the beginning will go through these in a lot more detail for those who have the appetite for it <laughs> Barakallahu feekum, uh, for this uh, summary and systematic breakdown. I mean, this is such an important topic, not not merely from an apologetics angle, whereby yeah. we're simply seeking to address the intellectual confusion of some people, yes. but it's yes. also very yes. spiritually and theologically enriching to understand just how important making dua is for our own souls and yeah. how our different theological beliefs ranging from Allah SWT, um, attributes to predestination all just beautifully complement one another. So, you know, just, once again, Jazakallah Khairan for, you know, doing the hard work of bringing all these points together and brilliantly 
articulating them for our listeners. And as someone who read your article, I know that uh, you know you've done a great job simplifying and summarizing the the contents of that article. But as you said, if anyone's looking for something really rich, um, uh, more enriching, and they're and they love to read, your your article has a lot more to offer in terms of going into the depth uh, of these issues and showing what's currently being discussed in, in the current discourse uh, uh, on this matter. And, you know, looking at the arguments, uh, I, I find it, you know, uh, fascinating that a, a correct, um, oh, I think uh, Saf uh, left the room. Assalamu alaikum. Saf, uh, you're 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 muted. Yeah, sorry, Aki. You continue. You're saying about the uh, the importance of the du'a for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's. Uh, I'm just saying that it, it's it's extremely important. You know, for our own souls and um, and uh, for understanding how our different beliefs, ranging from Allah's attributes and predestination, um, just complement each other. And so, I also want to thank you for simplifying your article because. Uh, it was, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I know it went into a, a lot more depth and was very enriching. And for those that would love to read, uh, you know, such things, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll greatly benefit um, from your article. And, you know, I, I just want to say, looking at the arguments that you addressed, yeah. um, you know, I've, uh, you know, I could see that just having a correct understanding of Allah's omniscience um, you know, that would off the cuff probably address half of these arguments. So, you know, there was the uh, impassibility problem, the problem on, yes. of omniscience and the divine decree problem. It's just having a correct understanding of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine knowledge is. You don't even have to get into the depth, the yeah. weeds of it, um, should, you know, render these arguments, uh, should undermine the force of these arguments. But there was one thing I did want to ask you about, which, yeah. was, which was the first problem that you dealt with, the, the impassibility problem. Yes. Um, keeping aside, just keeping aside the divine timelessness and divine yeah. temporality um, the discussions and debates, can a divine temporalist who believes that Allah SWT, um, operates in time or not restricted or contained by time, but you know, operates in time, he, he acts successively. Can yeah. he at least address this specific objection that, you know, no du'a will not necessarily change Allah, will not change his mind or not change his ways because he also, the divine temporalist would also believe that Allah is omniscient and knows well yes. in advance uh, yes. what the person making, uh, that the person will be making du'a at this particular point and then yeah. have already yeah. decreed that in advance. So, I mean, just when it, to that specific objection, would the divine temporalist be in a position to to address that, you think? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think so. Um, the, what the divine, the, the, the divine temporalist will, will, will be in an advantage to say that when an act is done in time, i.e. the du'a, mm. making du'a for Khalid to reach home safely, mm. that du'a made by the person, let's say right now, God will know that act right there and right now as it occurs. And that will be something he knows. Mm. Um, mm. So in one sense then, um, the temporalists, view about god is that um the matter can be addressed there and then mm. not it's, it becomes quite hard to then how how does an eternalist someone who believes in a tem mm. i love in a temporal mm -mm -mm. how does an atemporal person then know the act as it occurs when okay. it does yeah, uh -huh. in time specifically so this is known as the, uh, the problem of tensed facts or yeah yeah how, yeah. how would an eternalist deal with because God doesn't know things. Oh, I think um, Saf is um, has frozen again. Let's give him some time. Divine 
I think the, the divine temporalists, um, depending on what, we have to look at some of the details of the divine temporalist view. So in, in philosophy, an eternal, an atemporal view of, divi- of the divine would mean that the knowledge isn't known at the time, at the specific time in which the act of du'a was made, as it were. Whereas a divine temporalist w- would agree that no, would would differ and say no god can know the act as it occurs in time and in fact i think it's a good question you ask um the temporalists of them would have the advantage of knowing of god knowing that the dua made at the time that it's made some of this i'm trying to bring out in my paper with uh sheikh Rasam ibn taymiyyah although at the moment and i know this is taking us away from our, our topic for today at the moment i know the academic Consensus seems to be that you know he was temporalist in his view. Um, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, I'm reading him as an eternalist generally, hmm. but he claims that Allah knows things in time, and what's our evidence for it? Scripture. Hmm. Allah tells us that He knows what people do at the time that the, that they do it. What more do you want? So, if Scripture is saying He knows things in time, then He knows things in time. Um, but ultimately, I'll say one thing on, on this issue, because I know it, it does open up a whole. Um, we can't discuss it unless we lay out the assumptions and the axioms of the temp- what temporalist model we're using and what a temporalist model we're using. But one thing Arazi is very emphatic in doing, especially in this, this topic of divine omniscience, he's ready to say in lots of parts in his tafsir, just don't know. We just leave it to how... Allah knows everything. We just got to leave it. Um, so the argument from argument from cluelessness, yeah, the argument from cluelessness. We just don't know. So we just leave it to the divine how He knows it. But I think there is a case to be made. Petitionary prayer and the temporalist model, um, and you know, and it's an invitation for fleshing out how that could look in terms of petitionary prayer, or even foreknowledge in general. I know you raised it mm. under foreknowledge. Great. So, you know, just one request before I uh, let you go. I mean, we've spoken a lot about du'a today, so I think it would only be suitable to end this discussion with some du'a. So can you please do us the honors? Allahumma ameen. Rabbana dhalamna anfusana wa illam tarfil lana wa tarahamna lana kuna al-fasim. اللهم إني أسألك من النعمة تمامها ومن العصمة دوامها ومن الرحمة شمولها ومن العافية عسولا ومن العيش أرغده ومن العمر أسعده ومن الإحسان أتمه ومن إنعام عمه ومن الفضل أعظبه ومن اللطف أقربه اللهم كن لنا ولا تكن علينا اللهم أختم بالسعادة آجالا وحقق بزيادة آمالا واخل بنا وقرن بالعافية غضونا وأصالنا وجعل إلى رحمتك مصيرنا ومآلنا واصبب السجال عفوك على ذنوبنا ومن علينا بإصلاح عيوبنا وجعل التقوى زادنا وفي دينك اجتهادنا وعليك توكلنا واعتمادنا اللهم ثبتنا على نهج الاستقامة وعذنا في الدنيا من الموجبات الندامة يوم القيامة وخفف عنا ثقل أوزار ورزقنا عيشة الأبرار وقفنا واصرف عنا شر الأشرار وعد رقابنا ورقاب آبائنا وأمهاتنا وإخواننا وأخواتنا من النار برحمتك يا عزيز ويا غفار يا كريم ويا ستار يا عليم ويا جبار يا الله يا الله يا الله برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين ويا أول الأولين ويا آخر الآخرين برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين ويا ذو القوة المتين ويا راحم المساكين ويا أرحم الراحمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين وصلى الله على حبيبك محمد وآله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين رب العالمين جزاكم الله خيرا أخي been an honor for you to go. Been an honor for you know having you here uh, on blogging theology and shall we hope to to have you more uh, in the future. Keep up the good work and and we make dua to Allah Azza wa Jalla that makes this I say, you know, a lighthouse, a beacon um for all of us. And you you probably don't know how many people you've benefited and are benefiting by the fadl and the karam of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And it just 
uh, we ask Allah to take it from strength to strength and keep it and keep it up. And Allah give you all tawfiq and the team. Inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, akhi. And, you know, thank you once again for this uh, very insightful and uh, beneficial uh, presentation today. And I'm going to part you and our listeners with the Islamic greetings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.